We have two Big 12 programs who, in their own way, very different ways, lost heartbreaking games this past Saturday. West Virginia in a loss to Oklahoma State and UCF in a tough loss to Oklahoma in Norman. These two programs will meet this coming Saturday, October 28th, in Orlando. Should be a heck of a football game, and we're going to talk about it with a guest right after this word from my sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Dutch Miller Automotive, where friends and family pricing means you get the best deal right up front on any new or pre-loved vehicle in stock every time. With brands like Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GMC, Buick, and Subaru, the Dutch Miller Automotive family is always growing and ready to put you in the car or truck you've been searching for. Check out our inventory across West Virginia at DutchMillerAuto.com or come in today to the home of friends and family pricing only at a Dutch Miller Automotive store near you. What is up, college sports fans, Big 12 fans, fellow members of Mountaineer Nation? This is Coos, and welcome in to another edition of Coos's Corner. Belly yourself up to the bar and let me serve you up another shot of top-shelf college football content. On tap in today's episode, I'm bringing on a guest bartender to serve you up this top-shelf content, and his name is Adam. He is with the Sons of UCF podcast. He covers the UCF Knights, and we're going to preview this Saturday's game between the Knights and our West Virginia Mountaineers. Adam, how you doing? I'm good, Coos. Thanks for that intro. I didn't know we were doing bar shots. I'd, I'd, have, I'd have come prepared. <laughs> I hear you, man. Hey, it's it's all top shelf football, man. It's all top shelf. After um, this weekend, I need a couple of top shelf items buddy, because it, it was a rough one. Both. You and me both. Uh, and uh, tell you what, man, we got two two programs both coming off tough losses in, in different ways. I mean, West Virginia went into the fourth quarter with a lead uh, against Oklahoma State and squandered that lead. Uh, and, of course, you know, Ollie Gordon didn't help matters any. That guy's an absolute stud But uh, over, over on Oklahoma State side. but uh, And you guys, man, you guys had Oklahoma, I thought, right for the picking there for an upset. And, unfortunately, you guys weren't able to hold on. So, uh, first, let's talk about that a little bit. How, what's the mood in Orlando coming off that game, man? Yeah, it's kind of split. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people out there who – you know, the, the phrase moral victory sometimes gets thrown around and, and that, that can be a bit of a, of a dirty phrase, right? Because you, if either you win or you don't win, right? But I think for a lot of UCF fans, the words moral victory are kind of being bandied about because I, I, most people, we were three touchdown underdogs. I think most people thought this was going to be a blowout by Oklahoma. So t- to be in it late, uh, to still have the lead uh, with 13 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, um, I, I think fans were, were really excited to see how UCF played. To your point, ultimately, we couldn't close the deal let Oklahoma back in it. And then I would say that they win the ball game. Um, but I, I think fans are encouraged by what they saw on Saturday and then even more dumbfounded because we didn't see that the previous week against Kansas. You know, we didn't really see that against Kansas state. So I, I think there's, you know, some, some optimism, but a little bit of skepticism still too, because it's kind of like, where did that team come from and, and why weren't we doing that all along? Yeah. Um, but you know, it's tough to take the moral victory on this one, but you know, at the net net of it, you hung in with the number six team in the nation on the road with a team that's kind of banged up and, and a little bit under the weather, and, and mm-hmm. you still had a chance to win. So you like those things, you just would have liked that to come out with a victory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I watched some of that game. I was trying to between that game and the Ohio State Penn State game was kind of going back and forth, but uh, when that game was so close at the end, I kind of stayed on that one and watched the end of it, man. It was an exciting game. And I was, I was cheering for you guys, you know, it's uh, I always root for the underdog. Um, and, and it's, you know, you guys are going to be future conference mates. Oklahoma's leaving. So yeah. I felt like it would be great for the league uh, for you guys to pull that game out. You know, um, you know, for us, you know, we lost a game to a team we actually were favored against at home, had a 24, 20 league going into the fourth quarter, made a, really egregious special teams mistake that got them the ball in deep in, in our territory. They were able to score. And from there on, we were never able to, uh, to get the lead back and uh, just really heartbreaking fashion to lose it in that way, especially coming off the previous week where we lost on a friggin' Hail Mary, you know, uh, we really needed that game to be a get right game for the Mountaineers. And it just didn't, didn't turn out that way. So uh, two, two teams coming off tough losses. It'll, it'll be, anx- it'll be interesting to see how these teams respond. Um, you know, on Saturday, um, there in Orlando, it's a 12 o'clock Eastern time kickoff. For those of you who are wondering, uh, we're on FS1. If you want to catch it on the TV, I myself are, are going to be there. I'm sure Adam will be there as well. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Adam, real quick, before we get too, uh, too much further in, man, will you let my listeners know and my viewers know where they can find you? 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. So any social media thing that you guys do, if it's X or or Instagram, whatever, you can find us at Sons of UCF. Our podcast available on any major player. So just search Sons of UCF. We have a YouTube channel as well, at Sons of UCF. We have exclusive content, videos, interviews, um, all kinds of stuff there. And our new website, sonsofucf.com. Uh, we have articles. We have uh, we have some videos we've done as well, too. So if you're looking for some UCF knowledge, we got you covered. Just search Sons of UCF where you, wherever you want to do that kind of stuff, and uh, and we'll be there for you. Awesome. Thank you for that, man. And thank you, thank you again for taking time out of your Sunday to come on with me here and uh, knock this, knock out this preview, man. Because I'm, uh, I'm excited about this game. I, like I said, I hope it'll be a time where we can kind of put this, this past weekend's game behind us and move on. But uh, real quick, I just want to ask you uh, when I, when I look at UCF, man, I see that up until this Saturday, you guys had struggled to stop the run. I thought, but you, you guys did a really good job holding Oklahoma's run game in check. And forcing them to be a one-dimensional team, but uh, so what? I mean, is what's been the biggest struggle for UCF on the defensive side of the ball this year overall? Yeah, obviously it's been running uh, the rushing defense, right? And, and I think you know if you look at um, you know what UCF did at Kansas, that's the game you're referring to. We gave up 390 yard yards on the ground at Kansas, which is just unheard of, right? Mm -hmm. um, and look, from what I've heard from people, Kansas runs a pretty unique running scheme. Uh, they do some things differently than, than, than other other schools do. Right. Oklahoma's a little bit more vanilla in their running scheme, so there's part of it maybe that just the the, the matchup was better for UCF this uh, this Saturday. But it, it's been a team that's been banged up. Um, you know, we've, we've had a bunch of guys kind of in and out of the, of the lineup on the D line area. Um, and UCF's linebacker core is, is certainly the, the weakness of the defense. Jason Johnson's a name you'll hear a lot. He wears number zero. He makes a lot of plays. Uh, he'll be always around the football, but, um, outside of that, we don't have a lot of depth at linebacker. Um, our linebackers have, have been relatively undisciplined. I mean, Gus Malzahn and the coaching staff have talked a lot about our run fits and running and, and, you know, running lanes, not being covered by, by the right guy. So it's been a bit of a struggle on the defensive side of the ball. The secondary actually has played pretty well. Um, they're, they're a younger group kind of coming together, but the secondary has actually probably been the bright spot on the defense, but it's really been that, you know, that front six for UCF. So UCF runs a, a four, two, five. So that front six for UCF on defense mm -hmm. has really been where the, where the struggles have come from. They also don't get a ton of pressure on the quarterback. I mean, um, you, you know, we're not going to be a team that's going to, going to be in your backfield all day long. We have a couple special guys on the edge who can, you know, make a play or two here and there, but you're not going to get consistent pass rush. It's not a blitzing team as well. So a lot of it's been very vanilla. We kind of, you know, lay back and, and wait for you to sort of run into us and hope you you fall into our arms and we can tackle you. Uh, and, and so, you know, they've got to get more aggressive. You saw some of that on Saturday at Oklahoma. To your point earlier, how much of that can carry over to this game? I think that's mm -hmm. going to be the thing to, to watch for on Saturday. Yeah. You mentioned Jason Johnson. I see here he's third in the conference in tackles right now, so he's doing pretty well there. And he's he's uh you say he's one of your linebackers, right? Number zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he's he's kind of the the linebacker um, that's got the most experience. He's a uh, I think he's one of the super seniors. I think they call those guys. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got a lot of experience playing playing football. I'll say this: he's not he's he's a really solid football player. Uh, he's not a, a game changer though, right? He's not going to be that guy that's going to make the big hit that, you know, pops a fumble. He's not going to, you know, pressure the quarterback and get a big, big blitz, but he's always around the football. He makes a smart play. He makes tackles when guys are in his space, but he's not going to, you know, knock your socks off with, you know, his athleticism or his speed. Um, he's just always around the football, just a very solid, solid football player. Yeah. So you'll see number zero flying around on defense. And there's, if there's tackles on the field and you see guys getting off the pile, number zero will be, will be very nearby that pile almost every time. Yeah. Thanks for that. And you you mentioned your secondary. And when I look, it's it's funny because when I look at UCF's defense as a whole, the rush defense obviously is near the bottom of the Big 12. But then when I look at your pass defense, you're actually second in the league in pass defense behind Iowa State. What is the magic to that, man? Is is it that secondary? I mean, because you said you're not getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. So isn't the, isn't the secondary that's really leading that charge? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I look at it this way. Um Look, we've also given up so many yards on on the ground. Why would you throw the football? Right, just keep handing it off to somebody. It's been working. So, I don't I don't know how much it's been tested from a secondary perspective because I think once Kansas State and, and Baylor and Kansas realize that they can just turn around and hand off and get success, you know, why why would you not do that more times than not? Yeah. But I'll yeah. say we have we have a um, two veteran corners um, that that have been around UCF for a couple of years now. We brought in a transfer into tour into Corey and Patterson who led the nation in interceptions last year at Middle Tennessee State. So you've got some veteran players in, in the in the secondary 
secondary um, that have played, you know, played a lot of meaningful snaps in college football. And we got one really young guy in the secondary. It's a true sophomore named Kai Martinez, number 21. And, and he's a guy that he's just, he's stepped in big and he's made a lot of big plays. He's always around the football as well too. So I think that unit's really playing well together. They're experienced, you know, they're, they're not going to get beat deep a lot. So they're, they're going to give you the underneath stuff a little bit, right? They're going to give you that seven yard hitch. And, and we've been successful so far at tackling that person at that seven yard mark and not having them break that for another 40 yards. So I think that's what you've seen so far in the secondary is they've kind of been, don't break, but they got experience. And I think they know when to, when to sort of turn it on um, and, and what that looks like. So, you know, but they haven't been tested. So we'll see, obviously, if West Virginia takes shots on them, we'll see how they how they respond. But really, in some respects, it's kind of like they're the best because the rush defense has been so bad. Why, why would you throw the football if you can run for 400 yards on, on the ground? Yeah, I got you. Well, that's an interesting you mentioned about the, uh, you know, not giving up a lot of deep stuff because that's actually Garrett Green's strength is the deep ball. Uh, that's been, you know, obviously he's, he's a great run. He's great with running with the football. That's his strength probably. He ran for 117 yards yesterday in that game, and he threw for about 249, 250. Uh, but a lot of that is over the top stuff. He's, you know, we're because of our we run the ball so much. We're a run first team. It opens up a lot of play action stuff for him, and he's able to get some chunk plays down the field. And he's actually more accurate on deep balls. To be honest with you, one of his mm-hmm. biggest struggles this year has been his accuracy on some of the intermediate and shorter stuff. Now, now he he is improving on that. Seems like each game he's getting a little better, but uh, especially early in the game, he tends to overthrow a lot of the shorter shorter stuff. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, you know. I'm sure they'll test your your DBs on the deep ball at some point in the game, maybe even early in the game, on some play action stuff and some RPO stuff. So uh, that'll be an interesting matchup to watch. I think uh, will be our our receivers versus your DBs on on the deep ball. Um, how do you guys do with running quarterbacks um, typically? Um, pretty good. I mean, I, you know, Dylan Gabriel gashed us a little bit on uh, on Saturday against Oklahoma. I think a lot of that. So because you don't think he's going to run. Um, but typically the, the, we've, we've got some some guys on the edge um, who who play pretty soundly. Tra- Traymond Morris Brash, who wears number three, you'll, you'll see him a lot out there. And UCF has a lot of speed on defense as well. So, you know, the linebackers notwithstanding, the secondary has a lot of speed. So, um, you know, we've, we've had some success against stopping running quarterbacks. You know, I mean, our, our, our defense obviously, obviously goes against our offense every day in practice. We have a running quarterback quarterback and John Rice Plumley, um, And so there's probably some familiarity every, every day you're seeing it in practice, you're kind of practicing against something like that. So there's probably some familiarity from that perspective as well. But uh, again, our, our run fits in general have been a bit of a challenge. So I think that's, you know, that that's what will be interesting to see if, if UCF really did clean that up, that they find something this past week and, and now they can apply that, or was it just kind of the, the matchup against Oklahoma, but yeah. um, there'll be some yards to be had on, on the ground from the quarterback position. Um, you know, if, if the offense can put it together, but um, you know, again, I think they're they're typically more um, they're more vulnerable up the middle. I would say from a rush defense perspective, if you get out on the edges, UCF has some athletes that'll get you. But if you run some quarterback stuff, some draws right up the middle, you, you'll probably get a, a couple of chunk plays out of that. Yeah, interesting because that, that's actually the strength of our well, the strength of our D line or O line, I should say, is our center Zach Frazier mm-hmm. and then our two our two tackles. Um, you mentioned Morris Brash. Um, can you talk about him? Well, he, he leads the Big 12 in tackles for loss and sacks right now. He does, yeah. From, from, he's a D-end, right? So UCF plays kind of a, a hybrid defense. They call him um, uh, the the buck position, B-U-C-K. So he's he's really kind of a linebacker, but he stands up on the D-line. He's usually yeah. not going to have his hand in the dirt. He'll, he'll, he'll stand up. Uh, he's not the fastest guy. He's not the quickest guy. Um, you know, his, his motor has been at times questioned, I think, by UCF fans. But he's also uh, a fifth-year senior, so he's got a lot of experience. I think he understands when to turn it on, you know, when to, you know, do some hand fighting, when to, when to pull a move on, on an offensive lineman. You know, he's not going to he's not going to wow you again with the speed he's, he's not a an overly big guy he's not going to bull rush you but he just he seems to be in the right position uh, i think he uses a lot of his experience to get him in the right spots um and when when time to make a, a big play he, he's typically has shown up but he's not gonna he's not gonna fly off the screen at you right he's not gonna you know he's not gonna you know turn on the tape and you're not gonna be like oh my goodness this guy's everywhere but he picks the spots makes really good successful plays um he's he's a, he's a sure tackler too i think ucf's had some issues on tackling mm-hmm. Tremont is, is actually pretty good once he gets his hands on it you're probably going to go down so I think he's just got a good fundamentals, you know, good good intelligence about him, and he knows when to when to turn it on. He uses a little bit of that veteran savvy. So interesting for you to mention that your tackles are kind of a, a, an experience point for West Virginia. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to uh, see that matchup and see how he goes against those guys and sort of who you know who wins kind of the the one on one battle in every rep. Yeah, does he line up on? Do, you mentioned he. 
Yeah, he'll switch he'll sides. He'll switch both sides. Yeah, he'll so, yep. Yeah. yeah, he'll go left, right. Yeah. It sounds a lot like West Virginia what they have with their bandit position. Uh, we yeah. have a guy because we run a similar defense, and we have a guy named Jared Bartlett who who does the same, and and his backup Tyron Bradley play has been playing quite a bit as well. Um, and those guys will line up on on different sides too, depending on um, what's called on the defense. So, it, yeah. But you're right. It'll be a good another good matchup will be uh, to see him versus our, our tackles Doug Nestor and Wyatt Milam. On the, on who can win more, more of those one on ones, uh, talk about the middle of your defensive front for a minute. Um, I guess you you run more of a three 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 guys with their hand in the dirt, right? And plus 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 Morris Brash on the outside. Yeah. yeah. Um, who's your nose tackle, and and uh, is he pretty good or no? Yeah, we got two big guys in the middle. Uh, Ricky Barber, number five, uh, and Lee Hunter, where's number two? Lee Hunter's like 6'4", 325, but he's quick as a cat. Uh, so he's a really quick interior player. Um, Ricky Barber's been injured the last three games. He played against Oklahoma finally, but he'd been injured before that. So we haven't really seen them you know, play side by side that much in Big 12 competition. So this is really the first game that I think that the two of them were able to to play together. And and they're big boys up front. They're, they're big boys. They got big motors. Again, Lee Hunter is quicker than you probably would think when you see somebody of, of that size. Uh, but they I don't know how much experience they've, they've really been able to gel together playing this year. So, yeah, I, I think they're just kind of getting that together. But th those are two of our bigger players. You also see true freshman John Walker, number 55, mm -hmm. um, and then Malachi Lawrence, number 51. Uh, those are kind of the rotational guys that will come in. Malachi's got a high motor. He, he'll be in your backfield. John Walker for a true freshman uh, holds his own against the line. Um, he hasn't made any one of those splash plays, as I would call them, but he's just a solid, solid guy. I think for UCF, the challenge you're going to see is is depth. I, I mentioned, what, four guys right there. Those are really the only guys that are going to play. Yeah. And so I think that's where UCF's had trouble throughout the year is when the game gets gets long, you know, late third, early fourth quarter, you don't have a lot of depth. These guys are getting tired. You know, the other teams are running the ball against them, and I think that's where UCF's had challenges is just staying fresh on that D-line because we don't ha have a lot of depth. So early in the game, um, yeah, especially a home crowd, you probably see these guys flying around a bunch. But if you really want to kind of understand, you know, how, how it's going, check back in late third quarter and see what that what that push is looking like, right? Watch the lines and see how much push West Virginia's O-line is able to get against UCF's D-line. That'll really kind of tell the, the series of the game as you get in that third and fourth quarter. Again, depth's been a challenge. I think conditioning's been a challenge at times. So I, I think there's an opportunity for offensive lines to wear our D-line down. Um and I think that's something that UCF fans have kind of seen and, and are concerned about as we've entered our, our now our fifth game here in Big Twelve play. Interesting. Now, what about your depth? You know, in the in the in the back uh, the backs the back five, I guess, and your linebacker and secondary. Yeah. Yeah, linebacker, no depth at all. I mean, Jason Johnson is the guy. You're going to see a couple other guys rotate in, but they haven't settled on who that second linebacker is. More times than not, it's Walter Yates to 30, where's number 27. Um, he'll probably be in there most, but they've been rotating a bunch of guys, I think, trying to find who that person is. And the fact that they keep doing that leads me to think they just haven't figured that out. Yeah. On the back secondary, though, we do have a, a handful of guys who can play. I mean, you'll see a, a lot of rotation uh, on the secondary. You'll see guys like Nakai Martinez, I mentioned. But you'll see veterans like the Jordan Mask and Quadric Bullard back there. Um, so UCF will rotate a ton in the secondary. I think that they're pretty deep at that position. It's really, you know, that that front, the, the front four, if you count Tremont Morris Brash, I mean, th they're good. They're just going to, they're going to wear down on you. The linebackers are coin flip every game. And then again, I think our secondary, we have the ability to have some depth in there. So if guys get, you know, dinged up or, you know, somebody gets a hangnail, UCF is going to be okay if, if that happens on the back, on the back end. If it happens on the front line or linebacker, especially if it's Jason Johnson, mm -hmm. then we got problems. Okay. And that's kind of the opposite of, of West Virginia. And this will, this will kind of segue into, you know, flipping sides of the ball here. But when you look at West Virginia, we actually have the opposite problem. We are we can rotate 10 to 11 defensive linemen in at any given time with very little drop off. Hmm. Um, it's the strength, one of the strengths of our team. But when you look at our linebacker position and our secondary, due to, you know, talent and then some injuries we've sustained at those positions, some of them being season, season ending injuries. It's really hurt our depth. I mean, when you look at our snap counts, we've got two or three guys who have played 100 percent of the snap between 90 and 100 percent of the snaps this mm -hmm. year. Uh, and I mean, when you look at yesterday's game in the fourth quarter, we gave up 28 points and 150 yards rushing in the fourth quarter, 150 yards rushing to Ollie Gordon alone in the fourth quarter. Um, and you could you, you could see a huge difference in our defense between quarter one and quarter four. Now, when they asked Coach Brown about it in the post game press conference. He says he refuses to use that as, as an excuse because of all the conditioning they do. But, man, I mean, the, it's right there. I mean, you can see it with your own eyes, and then also it's in the numbers when you look at snap counts. I mean, these guys are just getting 
in the secondary and the line at the linebacker spot are just getting worn down by the fourth quarter. Sure. Uh, and this team, we're not built to blow teams away. We're just not good enough yet. And when you let teams hang around and it's a close game in the fourth quarter and your guys are wearing down at the second and third, third level, uh, you know, teams can, can teams can gash us. And unfortunately, it's reared its head the last two weeks. We've played two pretty good offenses. Um, I think the first couple Big 12 games against TCU and Texas Tech, we, you know, those two teams have ended up not being very good, let's face it, and uh, not as good as we thought. And we were able to, 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 win, to win battles against those teams late in the game because, you know, let's just face it, their, their offenses weren't as good as we thought they would be. Sure. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get Texas Tech. I, I shouldn't say lucky. I don't want to see anybody get injured. But, you know, Baron, uh, Tyler Shuck got injured in that game early. So sure. we, we played Baron Morton, the backup for most of the game. Uh, and then TCU is just not very good. So Houston and Oklahoma State both have good offenses. And by the time the fourth quarter came around, our defense just wasn't able to hold up. Um so we we kind of have the opposite problem as you guys. It's our second and third level where we have no depth. Um, when you look at your all's offense, obviously our running running the ball has been. You guys have been really good at running the football. You have two running backs in the top ten in the conference and, and run rushing. Yeah. R.J. Harvey being you know being top of the list. Uh, talk a little bit about him and what he brings to the table. Yeah, RJ is a uh, he, he's he's a smaller guy. He's like five eight five nine. Um, I think UCF lists him at two hundred five, but I think he's I think he's thicker than that. Uh, and so you, you probably will underestimate him when you see him on the field and be like, oh, that guy really. But he he will put his his head down, man. He will run through some guys. He's not afraid of contact. Um, he's not a speedster, right? I mean, he's fast. Don't get me wrong. Or he's faster than you and I probably ever will be, right? But he's he's not a speedster. He's not game breaking speed. If you saw the Oklahoma game, he had a, a nice large run, uh, but ended up getting caught towards the end there, right? Because yeah. uh, you know just didn't have the speed to, to keep up. But but he he is a, a physical runner. He'll run between the tackles. He'll put his head down. He'll he'll, he'll knock you down and get a couple yards. Um, and he can break a couple of explosive plays from time to time as well. So he will be the, the featured back. You mentioned that the second running back, that's probably Johnny Richardson. Uh, yep. he also wears number zero. Now he is different from RJ. He's about five, seven, probably 170 pounds soaking wet, but he is quick as lightning. Mm -hmm. Um, he's not. I always try to describe Johnny to people. He's not like elusive. He's fast. If that makes any sense. Like, yeah. If he gets the edge on you, like he's gone. Like that, that's just, that's just it. He's gone. He's not going to, you know, juke you out of your shoes. Right. He's not going to, he's not a Marshall Falk, Barry Sanders type of guy. He's just going to put his foot in the ground, get upfield. And if he's got the leverage on you, he's going to outrun you. He doesn't get the ball as much as RJ, which is really interesting. I think he had six carries in the game against Oklahoma. I think RJ had 15 or 16, something like that. So um, RJ typically gets double the carries of Johnny. But Johnny's kind of that big game breaker. You know, he, he may have two runs for two yards, and that third run goes for 80. And so he's he's liable to hit a home run every time he touches the football. Where RJ, you know, is probably going to be more um, more disciplined, a little bit more um, consistent throughout. Again, he'll break a big one here and there, but he's, he's not going to be that guy that's running 60 yards down the field. Well, I guess a team like West Virginia, where we're so thin in the second at the second level, second and third levels, I could see maybe Gus Malzahn using RJ Harvey a lot early in the game to wear us down, and then come fourth quarter once our defense is tired, bring bring uh, Richardson in to hit a big one. You know, uh, yeah. That that's yeah they, they 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 play well off each other. I mean that they'll they'll rotate them in pretty quickly, um, and so. I think you'll see a heavy dose of both those guys too. We also have another uh, bigger running back, Jordan McDonald. He's he's six one two twenty five. He was getting a lot of touches earlier in the year. He hasn't played in the last couple of games, but you know he's he's kind of that short yardage third and one, fourth and one back. That usually was his role. That's been RJ Harvey the last couple of weeks. So um, we'll see if if Gus makes a change there as well. The other thing that Gus will absolutely do, I promise you, on everything I have, is at some point in time you will see the Wildcat. We we he loves to do direct snaps. RJ Harvey typically is the guy. Again, those so you will absolutely see a wildcat play or two um throughout the game typically to to rj harvey typically in short yardage right third and two fourth and one um ucf has a tendency to go wildcat in those spots interesting um i'll tell you what i was impressed with john rice Plumley yesterday I, I, i've heard a lot of talk about him not being able to throw the football uh that he's a, a runner only well i'll tell you what yesterday he threw the f football pretty darn well and and he was not able to he was not able to be his normal normal self because of his knee injury, but he was standing in the pocket making making big time throws against Oklahoma yesterday who and Oklahoma's defense is a good defense. And what 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 do you have to say about Rice Plumley and, and his number one, his performance yesterday and just um his his performance overall on the year and then two his health. Is he going to be back closer to hundred percent next week, you think? 
Yeah, I'll I'll start with the health first. I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, we've been told he's going to have that knee brace on his on his leg throughout the rest of the season, um, and maybe that's precaution. I don't know, but I don't I don't think you're going to see him back at the the pre knee injury level. But he just needs to be enough of a threat that you have to keep the defense honest, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you could tell against Oklahoma that he was not going to be a threat to run. I think he had a couple of design runs, but you would have seen him much more earlier in right. the season with John Rice Plumley. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he can rehab and get better and get a little bit of strength there, but part of UCF's offense is that defensive line looking going, okay, is this guy going to keep it and run or is he going to, is he going to hand it off? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you can tell if he's going to keep it and run, he, he's, he's not, um, I don't, he doesn't look as comfortable as he, as he once was doing that, but I'm, I'm sure they'll find some ways to, to put that in place in terms of his play on Saturday. I would say it's probably the best game we've seen John Rice Plumley play um, in the UCF uniform. And it's funny is, is it comes off of obviously the injury, but um, afterwards we learned that he had been down with the flu all day Friday. So he had, you know, hundred and something fever, got a bunch of IVs before the game. Uh, even his post game press conference, you can see on his face, you can just tell that's a guy who does not feel well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he probably had his best game at, at UCF and, yeah, yes, the, the knock on him has been his his ability to get the ball downfield. Last year, he struggled mightily with that. This year, there was a lot of talk about fixing mechanics and you know really spending time being a quarterback. And we've seen glimpses now of him making throws. That throw he made in the end zone to essentially you know, get us in position to maybe tie the game with a two point conversion. Uh, that was a, that was a great throw that he typically hasn't made. I think what's what's underrated about, or what's overrated maybe in some respects. I'm not even sure how to rate it. It's not his throwing ability as much as his decision making. And I think that's what got him in a lot of hot water last year is he wasn't really making sound decisions. Um, and I don't know if he didn't trust his reads. I don't know if he didn't trust the offense. We're still kind of learning stuff. But it was really decision making, I think, that more than anything that got him in some tough situations. I think he's improved that a little bit this year. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have the best arm, right, if you're not the strongest arm guy or you don't have the most accuracy, you know, if, as long as you make good decisions and, and get the ball in the right spots, you're going to be OK. Well, that was the problem is he, he doesn't have those two natural gifts from a throwing perspective and you make bad decisions. That's a recipe for disaster. Right. I think he's improved that a little bit this year um if he plays ball security has been been a problem he's thrown a couple of picks a couple of them weren't his fault off receivers hands that kind of stuff but if he does run and he was ucf's leading fumbler last year Mm -hmm. obviously him not running as much this year probably helps that but ball ball control ball security are also a big deal with john rice pumley but he's he's not you mentioned the 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 back half of the secondary for west virginia and that's going to be interesting i think to monitor throughout the game because ucf's offense is not predicated on the quarterback picking you apart Right. It's predicated on, you know, setting up the running game, you know, splash plays, chunk plays, Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting getting outside, getting some short little dink and dunk routes. It's not it's not predicated on on picking you apart and from a from a passing perspective. So it'd be real interesting to see how UCF chooses to attack if that is indeed what they perceive to be the the weakness on the secondary side for West Virginia, because Plumlee hasn't been that guy that's going to slice you and dice you and and surgically go downfield with a with a drive. That's that hasn't been his strength so far. Yeah. Piggybacking off the the John Rice Plumley conversation, uh, as far as the guys he's throwing the ball to, who's the one one or two guys that West Virginia fans need to you know need to be watching for to have a, potentially a big day on Saturday? Yeah, it's funny how you phrase that question because the, the the one or two guys are the guys who are number one and number two, uh, <laughs> number one Javon Baker, number two Kobe Hudson. Those yeah. are the two big play receivers for UCF. If you saw the Oklahoma game, mm-hmm. um, Javon Baker was the guy with the eighty six yard catch and the blow and the kiss to the sidelines. Uh, well, he got away it, with one, didn't he? He got away with one there for sure. And, well, luckily he got a penalty in the end zone because of course him and Kobe had to celebrate and cost us a kickoff yards. But yeah. I digress on that one. But those are the two uh, big play receivers. Again, neither one of them are going to be burners, right? You're, you're not talking about guys who are going to have. Know, track star speed, uh, but they're typically sure handed. Um, Kobe Hudson, specifically, kind of a bigger body, bigger frame, he'll go up and, and, and attack the football. Uh, but those are the two guys that you, we want to get the football to. What's been a challenge for UCF fans is they've we've had stretches where one of them sort of is, is kind of the quote unquote the man, but they've never put together a collective game for both of them, right? It's either Hudson goes off or Baker goes off. It's t- typically not both of them in the same game, mm-hmm. and whether that's by design or what the defense is given and or you know what's available to UCF, it, it's hard to know. But those are the two guys for sure that you're going to see a concerted effort to get the football to down the field yeah uh the next receiver also number now number three right so our receivers are number one number two and number three uh xavier townsend he's more of a, a slippery speedy he will put his foot in the ground and make a juke on you um he, he's a little bit more explosive when he's got the ball in his hands and ucf will try to get the ball to him in unique ways he'll do some uh some end arounds um you'll see him on some jet sweeps 
You'll see them on some tunnel screens, things that you don't see out of out of Baker and Hudson. They're going to be more downfield. So those are really the main three guys from the receiving core that UCF will spread the ball around to. And they're they're pretty, um, you know, they're pretty consistent there. There's, there's there's usually a pretty big drop off between the third and fourth receiver for UCF. So there's probably not a ton of other names on the outside you're going to see a lot of. Um, even the tight end, they don't they don't use as much as they probably should, frankly. Um, so you're going to see uh, of those three guys, Hudson, Baker, and Townsend. Those are going to be the guys that are typically going to have the football in their hands. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And for those UCF fans that might be listening, our, our number one guy on the secondary is a, a guy named Beanie Bishop. He's a he's a transfer from from Minnesota. He spent the first three years of his career at Western Kentucky, transferred to Minnesota last year, played mostly the nickel, nickel corner position for them. Wanted to be featured more, so he transferred to West Virginia this year. He's he's basically played every single snap this year um <laughs> on defense. Uh so I talked about the depth earlier. That's the one guy who's played every single snap. They just can't afford to take him off the field. And he leads the Big 12 in passes defended. And, uh, he, you know, he, he's pretty good. He's not – you know, I wouldn't say he's elite by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, but he's, he's a good corner. Uh, and he will they, – they, we play mostly a zone scheme, and they will move him around uh, to, to either side of the field. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he does against against your guy, your receivers uh, next week, with those UCF receivers. But um, do you guys have a tight end that you use much uh, in this offense? Yeah, Alec Holler, number 82, he's a six-year senior. He's the he's the starter, uh, sort of the veteran of the team. Again, he's more involved in, in sort of the, the run blocking game. Um, UCF usually has a tight end on the field, but they haven't necessarily gone to the tight end in the, in the passing game from time to time. Um, we do have a true freshman, Randy Pittman, where's number 13. He actually flashed out pretty good against Oklahoma. He had two catches for, I think, like 49 yards or something like that. Uh, he had a big one over the middle for, for about 30 yards. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know if that's just luck he had open or he, they saw something or they want to try to get him more involved. He's probably more of the pass catching tight end. Um, obviously, Alec Holler being a veteran is probably more suited in the run game. Uh, but you'll see UC, uh, UCF throughout. I mean, I think, you know, I was on a show last week with a, with another host and they were asking me about UCF's offense and how to describe the offense. And what's interesting about the way I think about it is I, I look at UCF's offense like it's more plays than a system, if that makes sense, right? There's no there's no system. Obviously, they want to run the ball first, uh, and, and they want to always establish the run. But UCF is big on, you'll see a lot of motion, a lot of eye candy, a lot of guys moving around, a lot of guys going left to right, um, you know, a lot of guys in jet sweep motion. You'll see a lot of eye candy trying to really keep the defense, you know, see what check and test their eye discipline. Are they going to stay where they are? Are they going to get confused and, and blow assignments? And that's typically how UCF offense has functioned. We're not a team that's going to go down the field and you know a, a 13 play drive you know eat up four and a half minutes in the clock UCF's looking to kind of hit that home run play right so they may lull you to sleep with a bunch of two yard gains and all of a sudden do something kind of crazy and, and get a big one so um and Holler just doesn't fit into that right because he's, he's not the fastest guy he's not an explosive right. player so he's going to be a guy even Randy Pittman the, they might get you know that five yard flat route right you know sort of the safety valve throw if Plumlee's in a little bit of trouble but they're typically not going to be featured um in the in the majority of the other passing game they're, 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 you'll see them more involved in the running game right Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah, we've got a, and I forgot to mention him earlier when we were talking about offense, you know, our offense versus UCF's defense. And that's Cole Taylor, um, tight end at West Virginia, transfer from LSU. He's six foot seven. One of our, he went into to, this past weekend's game as the leading receiver on the team as far as number of receptions go. They use him a lot for those over the middle, even in, some, in the screen game yeah. a lot. Um, so, you know, he, he, unfortunately, he fumbled the ball yesterday early in the game. Uh, he's normally, you know, he normally doesn't do that. Just, I guess it was just a, you know, just one of those boneheaded moments that happens. But, uh, but yeah, he he did fumble early, and I don't, he didn't get the ball much, uh, if at all, uh, in the game. But, but previous games, he's, you know, he's been targeted a lot, so he probably, I'm sure they'll go back to that again, especially if they see uh, some weakness in the in the linebacker. Yeah, well, yeah, that concerns me because yeah, if, yeah. if we're gonna have linebackers covering him out on the flat, that's that's not gonna be a strength of UCF, yeah. particularly at that size. So yeah, that that that's an interesting matchup to see if West Virginia wants to exploit sort of yeah. that, that soft middle of the of the field for UCF. Uh, how do you feel about your offensive line? It's a great question. I don't I don't know. I honestly don't know. From week to week, um, they, they play well. They were just named as a Joe Moore finalist, one of 23 schools that has a mid-season Joe Moore, which essentially is is given to a, the collective off- offensive line that's at the best. You look at the stats, right? You mentioned them earlier. We have we have two guys in the top 10 of the conference mm-hmm. in rushing. Uh, we're one of the top rushing offenses in the nation. And so you look at those numbers and go, oh my goodness, this must be a great offensive line. But it's it's been a little bit up and down. I think there's 
you know, if I'm being honest with you, I think there's probably a little bit of noise in that because again, UCF can pop a big play, right? So they can, you know, our first play at home against Baylor in our first ever big 12 home game, Johnny Richardson took a sweep for 71 yards to the house, right? That's really going to make your running averages look great, right? That's really going to make your, your yards per game look, look, look great. Uh, but uh, you know, they've, they've been a tad inconsistent. UCF's also been rotating a bunch. This is only the, the third game where they've had the same five guys start uh, in the game so far. And they've had guys, our, our current starting center actually started the season at left guard for us. Um, our current uh, uh, left uh, left guard, I'm sorry, our current right guard was, was left tackle at one point. Like we just moved everybody around for whatever reason. Uh, and so I, I don't know if they've settled in on who those core five guys are. Um, Oklahoma was living living in our backfield uh, on Saturday. And maybe that's a function of their defense and, and their pressure schemes, but they were living in the backfield and making things difficult. So I think the line is serviceable, but you've seen some times where it just doesn't look like we're ready for, for Big 12 play um, and that we're getting sort of bullied up front. So I'm curious to see what that looks like. Typically, UCF is a better home team than a road team, um, but Oklahoma was, was in our backfield a, a bunch uh, on Saturday. So I, I think that's an area where UCF fans continue to kind of scratch their heads and go, are we? good up front we don't right we, we scored points and we got a lot of yards but it didn't it didn't look like we were playing well so um you know i'm curious to see how that matchup uh, shakes out with west virginia as well yeah that will be interesting because we we uh, like i mentioned earlier we we can go 10 11 guys deep yeah. uh, on the defensive front we don't really have one guy who will look dominant but we are have 10 or 11 really good players and of course our starting three are good um but what they like to do, and, and you know, you guys run a similar defense, so I'm sure you understand this. But they they normally our, our defensive front typically are not the ones getting the pressure. It's usually coming from the linebacker position or the safety position. Yeah, um, and they're typically taking up blocks. Now they will get you know Sean Martin, our defensive end, will get in the backfield on occasion. Uh, or Mike Lockhart, our starting nose, has done a pretty good solid job this year. Uh, they they've taken a step back a little bit the last couple of weeks as far as their their numbers go, but they're still good. Uh, you know, I still have a lot of faith in those guys. Uh, so that should be an interesting matchup. I was look, you know, looking here. You guys are tenth in the conference and and uh, sacks given up. So you know, you guys will give up some sacks uh, up front. I see. So that's that's one area I'm hoping the Mountaineers can exploit on Saturday. Yeah. That's interesting, actually. It's interesting stat because what's what's funny about that is um, so with John Rice Plumley, typically he runs his way out of sacks, right? Like he's mm -hmm. he's fast enough, he's going to get out of those. But in the games he didn't play, we had a, 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 a true sophomore, um, Timmy McLean, started, mm -hmm. and he is nowhere near the runner John Rice Plumley is. He took right. a lot of bad sacks yeah. where he should have thrown the ball away. So that, that's an interesting stat because I think some of that, you know, they, they often right. say that stats a shared responsibility on sacks, right? I, th I think the quarterback so far for UCF has owned a, a bigger part of that. But again, I. If you told me, that, hey, Adam, I saw the game this Saturday and I saw UCF line and they were they were bad, I would go, yeah, makes sense. And if you were yeah. like, hey, I saw your line, they were they weren't they weren't half bad. I go, okay, makes sense. I, I just don't think you know from from week to week what you're going to get. Yeah. Conversely, West Virginia's a, West Virginia's only given up eight sacks in seven games. Uh, hmm. So that's you know our our O line's done a bang up job in pass protection. Yeah. Um, the run the run run game has been, you know, okay. It's not set the world on fire. Um, Fortunately, we got a running or our quarterback who can run the ball well too, which is really the catalyst of our run game. Um, all right, real quick, I want to ask you real quick: Who's the one player on West Virginia's team uh, that makes you nervous going into Saturday? Yeah, I, I can't. I'm not going to give you one player uh, because I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. I'm going to give you a, whoever, whatever player has the ball in their arm and they're running forward, uh, particularly in the running game. I think obviously CJ uh, Donaldson is a guy, and also you mentioned Garrett Green, and that's where UCF has been challenged, right? Is stopping the run and and and, and really consistently stopping the run. Uh, you know, looking on, on stats, but the games I've seen, it looks like those two guys are certainly going to be threats to to run the ball. They're going to get the ball, an opportunity to run the ball a lot. Uh, we've made a lot of running backs look like all pros this year. So for, for me, it's anybody who's got the ball tucked between their their arm and the and their and their chest and rushing forward because that's where UCF has been a, a bit of a challenge. I know you mentioned that I think the tight end role is going to be interesting as well. Um, you know, receivers I, again. I think I'll take I'll take my chances that UCF can cover on, on the back end, but yeah. it's really up front. If if Donaldson or Green are going to get loose um, and and really start to find their rhythm, um, again, I think that's where I'm, I'm most concerned is with with your running game. I know you mentioned it maybe hasn't been the strength all year long, but UCF has the ability to make some. I mean, that's not, not that's not very good look very good so uh I'm, I'm concerned about uh, about the rushing attack on saturday yeah yeah and i uh same same with me on the other side i'm concerned about your all's rushing game because 
Um, even though West Virginia had been good at stopping the run up until the last couple of weeks, uh, I mean, Ollie Gordon just absolutely gashed us Saturday, and that concerns me. I, yeah. I'm worried that teams have found – you know, we do have one of our top players, uh, Trey Latham, who was a redshirt freshman. Uh, he was playing our wheel linebacker position. He was leading the Big 12 in quarterback hurries before he got hurt uh, hmm. a couple weeks ago. And uh, he's out for the year. And it seems like our defense just has not been the same since he's been out. I don't know if that's why or if teams have found some weaknesses – that they've been able to exploit. Like I mentioned, the depth has been an issue. So late in games, our defense, I think, is getting worn down. Um, so as good as UCF runs the football, I worry that late in the game, if it's a close game on Saturday, which I have no re reason to think it won't be, I worry that we won't be able to stop those two really good running backs because they're going to be fresh because they're, you know, neither one of those guys, like, like you mentioned, are necessarily carrying the load. Yeah. So they should be fairly fresh going into the fourth quarter. And if it's a close game, I'm not sure we'll be able to stop them. Um, yeah, I think the other thing for UCF that may, may have an advantage, obviously, this is a noon kickoff in Orlando. It, it'll be pretty spicy hot out there. Yeah, it'll be hot. Uh, and, and so it, it'll it'll wear on teams. Obviously, UCF used to practice, practicing in that. So does that give them a little bit of a of an edge late in, late in the game versus uh, versus West Virginia? Um, you know, it remains to be seen. Again, it also could rain in Orlando. You never know with Florida. It can rain right. at the drop of a hat. So, um, But you, you wonder if, they, if the, the temperature and the game time will kind of wear on some people, particularly if it's a, if it's a hot game out there. Yeah, that, that's that's something to think about for sure. Now, uh, you know, my, my wife and I coming down from West Virginia where it's been pretty chilly, uh, pretty cold. Uh, we're kind of looking forward to that 80 degrees, <laughs> yeah. 85 degree temperatures. But, uh, but you know, the players may not be. Uh, and I'm also <laughs> – this is off topic, but I'm concerned that these West Virginia guys are going to get down there and be like, man, we need to transfer here. <laughs> it's a lot nicer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be curious, and, and you and I can connect maybe after after you're down there. I'm always curious to, to hear uh, new, new fans' perspective of the UCF experience right we're we're a younger football program we're the youngest football program in, in a power five conference um you know our, our team didn't start playing until 1979 didn't go d1 until 1996 you know on campus stadium just opened in 2007 we opened it on a shoestring budget you know and we sort of outgrew it a little bit faster just by the way that we played so always curious to see the fan perspective around the ucf environment and it's kind of what you have down there um you know the all the pre-game activities festivities kind of the experience overall so i'll definitely make sure to connect with you sometime next week i'd love yeah. to get your uh, your feedback your perspective on how you enjoyed ucf and i will tell you one thing i know one of the things that's really been a conversation topic amongst fans is you know uh, is, is going out of our way to be very welcoming and grateful to the to the new fans, to the new teams that are mm -hmm. coming. I know I was at the Baylor game, and despite the fact that that turned out to be the probably the worst day of my life at this point, um, you know, everyone was really cordial. Baylor fans were cordial. UCA fans were cordial. Th thanks for coming yeah. down. Thanks for visiting as well, too. So my hope is that you and your wife and anybody else traveling to, to Orlando has a positive experience. Hopefully you come out with a loss, frankly, right? But yeah. um, I hope you have an overall positive game experience. But I, I'm, I'll definitely want to connect with you after and kind of get yeah. your, your thoughts on the UCF experience. Yeah, and we feel the same way in West Virginia. You know, in the past, West Virginia had a bad rap for having a rowdy crowd, but I'm telling you, that has really changed over the last uh, five to ten years. They made a lot of changes, rule changes, as far as uh, students aren't allowed to leave. No one's allowed to leave at halftime anymore and re-enter. Hmm. That's kind of that's quelled a lot of the bad behavior down to a to a degree. Um, they've strengthened a lot of the a lot of the laws, just frankly, in, in downtown Morgantown to curb a lot of. Like couch burning, for example. Couch burning, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, you yeah. do that now; it's it's basically a felony. So you're you're getting locked up. So, I mean, it's uh they've tried to improve, and 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 let's be honest, uh, most student sections at colleges get rowdy. Yeah, it's yeah. the nature of the game. But they should. Think, yeah. Outside of the student section, I think you'll see that West Virginia's crowd is extremely welcoming. Like just, and I've and I've seen that with a lot of crowds. I mean, I, I've not been to a lot of away games, but the ones I've been to. 95% of the fans are, are extremely welcoming and nice, and they're, they're just there to enjoy a game. Uh, you get one or two that might be might be pricks, but most of the time, most fans are just there to enjoy a good game, you know? That's, that's yeah. how I look at it. Yeah. Now, that video, uh, that viral video from West Virginia, I know the pit rivalry is, is obviously big, but mm -hmm. the Sweet Caroline sing-along yeah. that, that had changed some lyrics there. Uh, that, that video was really cool to see. That, that was awesome. Yeah. You know, UCF yeah. doesn't have anything like that. That was really, really cool to see. Yeah, it's it's a – we were actually – a lot of people were surprised that our AD allowed that to happen. But, uh, he, yeah. you know, he was like, look, man, he said this school's been through a lot of crap in the last year, year and a half with, you know, with the whole Bob Huggins thing. The football team's not – has struggled and – He's like our fans deserve that, so he let us. He let them do it. Um, yeah, they want to do it every game, but <laughs> he, he said that he won't go that far. 
Um, yeah, that, that was cool. It's one of those cool, like only in college town mm-hmm. type of moments. Do you see that kind of stuff? Which, you know, that's why we all love college football because you can have some of those unique experiences. Absolutely. I'm watching NFL. I'm watching NFL while you and I are talking, and, and you're not going to see the Patriots and the Bills break something like that out, right? right. That's only going to be something you see in a, in a cool college experience. Yeah. Uh, one last thing, man, and I'll let you go. Um, let's do some score predictions. What are, What are your thoughts on this game? Who, who comes out on top? You know, and and by what score? Yeah, here, here's my here's my analysis, right? It's really going to depend on, um, I think, two things. And, and we've talked about them now is, is who's better at stopping who's running game, right? Which team can run the ball more effectively, more consistently throughout the day, you know, and which team can, you know, limit turnovers and mistakes. That's been UCF's issue. Big on penalties, big on turnovers. That's that shot them in the foot a bunch of times. Um, coming off a game where, you know, we talked about Oklahoma, they had chances to win. I think they got some, hopefully some momentum back and maybe they got some, um, you know, some some confidence back in their game after the, the the horrible loss at home to Baylor and after getting just gashed by Kansas. So my hope here is that this is a bounce back for UCF. The locker room gets together this week and says, hey, you know what? We're 0-4 in conference. You know, we, we have three wins overall. We want to be bowl eligible. We need to win three of these next five games. And let's go on a run right now. Let's take that momentum from, from Oklahoma and let's let's apply it here. But UCF always makes it interesting. So I'm sure Gus Malzahn will call some trick play that has a you know a tight end catching a pass and ladder onto somebody and we'll fumble it and it'll go back the other way. So UCF always makes it interesting. But I gotta go home or I saw the the first lines came out were UCF minus six. Okay. Uh, and so I'm gonna go UCF 33, West Virginia 28. I don't think we cover, uh, but I'll I'll give us the win on Saturday. So you think it? So you think it's going to be a lower scoring game then? I do. Yeah, I, I do. I think especially if both teams want to run the football. Um, and, and you know, even UCF this past week, we we only mustered up twenty eight points. And our offense was, was a rather anemic. Uh, and so I, I think we'll I think we'll go lower scoring on this one. Um, yeah, you know, I think UCF will find a way to to screw some stuff up here and there. Maybe keep it within uh, within shouting distance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm going to go a little different. I do I do think. And I mean, when I say different, I mean, I think it's going to be a little bit higher scoring. You know, West Virginia's the two games we won in the Big 12 were low scoring games in the 20s. Um, we didn't pass the ball very well. We were run, we ran the ball and, and controlled the clock and won with our defense. Well, for whatever reason, since the bye week happened, this has been a totally different football team. Uh, we've been scoring more points, but also giving up a lot more points. Our, you know, it, we've kind of flip flopped. Our offense has become <laughs> the strength of the team, and the defense has went backwards. So, uh, and as good as UCF's offense is, you're one of the top two or three offenses in the league, I think, uh, at last glance. And uh, you can put up points. I don't think it'll be any different, especially late in the game. So, I'm looking for a more higher scoring game. I think it'll be more like 41-37. And unfortunately, a lot of my listeners get mad at me when I do this. They they think I should pick West Virginia to win every game. Uh, But I just – I try to be objective. Um, And this team is not trending in a good direction. It's on the road. It's going to be loud. It's going to be hot. Uh, I think UCF pulls off the win, forty-one thirty-seven. I don't think you, I'm, I'm with you. I don't think you cover. Yeah, uh, but I do think I do think you win the game by by one score um, or a little, you know. 41-37 yeah. UCF. Yeah, I mean, UCF's offense, I mean, they, they can be high-powered, right? But there's also, I mean, there are times that we just sub our toe and, and can't get out of our way. So I'd, I'd love 41 points out, out of UCF's offense. Uh, you know, against Baylor, I think we had 35. Uh, Kansas State, we were in the the, the, the high 20s. Uh, so we haven't really put that, that, that kind of point number up in the Big 12 so far. So if they can get consistent and, and make some plays, I'd, I'd love it. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. We haven't, we haven't been able to have that level of success yet against the Big 12 team. When you look at all five games West Virginia has played against Power Five team, or uh, I'm sorry, five of the six, but the last five we've played, five in the last five games we've played. Period. Actually, we we've we've given up we've given up uh, six, thirteen, twenty one, forty one, forty eight. Hmm. See that trend? I like the other two numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just don't feel great about us being able to stop you guys. Uh, at least, like I said, especially in the second second half of games, our defense is just gassed. I think they're getting gassed. And uh, well, the good news is UCF is also known. UCF is also prone to stopping themselves, so you may, you you may get a break yeah. or two. Well, we have along two, the way. Done a, we we had uh, we had two fifteen yard penalties on one play yesterday. <laughs> I mean, you, you, that's not winning football. We had a, no. ki- a kick return where a guy ran into our own ran into our returner. Now I think he might have been shoved a little. But it didn't get called. I don't even know if that's – is that against the rules? I don't know. But nonetheless, it didn't look good. And uh, (laughs) 
So again, we West Virginia is known to beat themselves a lot too. So it'll be interesting to see which team, and then it'll probably come down to that: which team makes the less mistakes in this game is sure. probably going to win. To be yeah. honest, yeah. But uh, Adam, one more time, man, before I let you out of here, where can everybody find your work? Yeah, I appreciate the uh, the platform. Appreciate you, you giving me some time here today. Uh, again, mm-hmm. Sons of UCF, wherever you do social media stuff, uh, you can find us on that. A podcast available wherever it is that you do your podcast stuff. Thursday night, 8 o'clock, we do a live show. So we'll be live on uh, our YouTube channel, which is at Sons of UCF, also on, on Twitter as well. So uh, if you want to swing by 8 o'clock on, uh, on Thursday night, we'll have some people on to talk about the game. You know, We'll have a couple of UCF folks coming on to give you some, some insight on that as well, too. So Thursday, 8 o'clock, if you're around, if you're available, uh, check us out on our YouTube channel at Sons of UCF. And again, our uh, our website, sonsofucf.com. All right, Adam. Thanks again, man. And uh, hopefully, we'll hook, like I said, I'll try to hook up with you after the game's over or whatever and uh, let you know how my experience went, man. Yeah, look, I uh, hope you and uh, your, your your family and everybody else going down has a, has a great uh, a great time in Orlando. And I uh, look forward to a good game on Saturday. Go Knights. Absolutely. Thanks again, man. And you have a great day. And everybody who's listening out there, be sure to have a top shelf day and Q Country Roads. Win or lose.